everybody, this is Perch. I'm back with Joe. How you doing, Joe? I'm all right, Perch. How are you? I'm doing great. And we're on with John Barber. John, how are you? I'm doing great, too. I'm glad, glad to be here. I'm glad to hear it. And and I'm excited to talk to you because you have a, I mean, you have a background. We've interviewed a lot of different people on this channel. And I think you come with a lot of different information that I think people are going to be really excited about. And uh, you got a big project. So can, let's start out with a big project first. So what is your big project? It's pretty huge news. Yeah. So uh, I'm uh, editor in chief of a, uh, a publishing uh, operation called Pan Universal Galactic Worldwide or Pug Worldwide or Pug nice. W. Uh, <laughs> and we are uh, we are coming out with the uh, Conan Colossal Edition, which is a giant uh, book uh, uh, repre- or presenting uh, classic Conan art in its full size, full color, you know, shot from the original art. Uh, I think you know the kind of books uh, we're talking about when I say that. Oh yeah, uh, and we're uh, yeah we're excited to do this with Conan. And you've got some good talent on this thing, so uh, so. Tell us, about, I mean, the, I, I read this list. It's like a who's who of who you want on a book. Yeah, well, I mean, so the, the big thing that we wanted to do with this, the big thing that we were able to do with this was uh, kind of give like an overview of the original run of Conan comics, uh, which mm-hmm. are like, I, I love Conan. Like, I love that world. Mm-hmm. I, I love all that stuff. But even that aside, like that run of Conan comics was so important to comics, you know, like, like both artistically and as like a, a business in that like, yeah. I mean, Conan and Star Wars kind of, yeah, I think, were widely regarded as the things that saved Marvel in the in the late seventies. Mm-hmm. Um, but the like the artists on that series are incredible. I mean, obviously, you have Barry Windsor Smith. I think that's like the artist that is most associated with Conan. Oh yeah, maybe with Frank Frazetta, you know, being like the the other one. That, he's not in this book, but uh, so who cares, yeah. right? Yeah, no, uh, yeah. but. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but I mean like Barry Windsor Smith's like uh, you know obviously his art defines a lot of what we think of as Conan and and um, and also what we think of as comics in a way you know like he, it was really uh, really important work so uh, you know we, we've got a we've got we've got four sections in the book uh, one of them is on Barry Windsor Smith uh, one of them is John Buscema one of them is Gil Kane and then the fourth one is kind of a catch all with a lot of different artists. Um, I, I think you could probably make the argument that those three are the big three of yeah. that era of Conan comics. Yeah, um, there's a couple other people who did a lot. I mean, like Jeff Isherwood did a lot of a lot of Conan. He's in the book too. Um, but the cool thing about that other section is you get some amazing artists that you you know maybe Conan adjacent people have done key Conan work, uh, but also some real surprises. You know, those ones that it's like oh oh. Oh, Jim Lee did some Conan art or Art mm-hmm. Adams. Uh, we've got some beautiful stuff from Neil Adams, um, Bill Sienkiewicz, Alex Toth, um, nice. uh, Jorge nice. Zafina. Uh, uh, I mean, I just, got, uh, God, I just can't. Uh, I Good Lord. Yeah, no, I mean, that's, a, that's an incredible batch of talent there. And for a lot of people, of course, who know Jim Lee from the work on the X-Men, and I guess we get to talk a little bit about X-Men with you as well. Um, but that's, uh, I mean, Art Adams, Neil Adams, that's um, it's an incredible roster of, of people in, in one project. I can go down the whole list if, 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 if you want. Uh, <laughs> it took me a second to open the PDF. Oh, there sure. you go. Yeah, yeah. um, well, while you're doing that, I'm just curious, uh, some of these, like, if people were familiar with, like, uh, some of like the IDW, like those artist editions and stuff. Would it, is this like a comparable book? Yeah. To, yeah. 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 And, and it like the, a lot of several people, including myself at uh, Pug W or, or XIDW, um, we're doing this through Zoop. Uh, mm-hmm. who, uh, some of uh, Eric Moss from Zoop is, you know, I've known him from IDW. Uh, as we all go back. Uh, so we know, you know, like we know some of the same printers, let's say, like the regular Zoop printer. Like we're actually printing this at the at the place that prints the the, the, the artist editions, oh, nice. uh, which I, I I say. And like also, just to be clear, we're also all friends with Scott Dunbeer. And all this is done with the utmost respect to, to Scott and everything he did uh, and everything he continues to do for uh, for these kind of books. Um, so no open but, warfare, you're saying. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 
we uh, uh, yeah yeah no we 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 all we all still hang out yeah I still eat lunch yeah. <laughs> okay all right some of these books now um I know some of these sections are, are clearly just going to be some of the the best of of the art but are there any um complete or near complete stories are there any like uh bigger like uh cover galleries like like how's the book uh coming together yeah uh a little of both um so yeah we we've got for the most part it's 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 pages um covers interior pages covering the whole breadth of the of conan you know so we've got like we'll have uh within each artist section the pages are organized chronologically so you can we'll we'll maybe be jumping from uh, like an issue of conan the barbarian to king conan to like the magazine the black and white magazine savage sword of conan or any of the Sometimes some weird one shots in there, you know, the movie specials or, you know, Conan giant size, that kind of stuff. Um, we are presenting all of those in chronological order. So you can kind of see how the artist evolves or some, sometimes it's also who, uh, what finishers are put on them. I mean, I think especially with, with uh, sorry, I was going to say, especially with Gil Kane, mm -hmm. I think he's probably, the, I mean, just, I mean, as a Gil Kane fan, I think like he's one of the artists that would be affected the most by who is finishing his art. Yeah, that him finishing himself looks really different than anyone else putting uh, putting brush to paper on his stuff. Um, but even on uh, on John Buscema, it's you know, it's fascinating to see all the different people that he worked with or that that, that did uh, uh, inks or finishes or or embellishing or whatever they whatever they would call it in any, any individual issue. No, um, so we, we do have uh, we have one complete story and it's a good one, uh, which is the um, uh, I'm going to say the name of it wrong. It's the uh, Devil Wings over Shadazar uh, by Barry Windsor Smith and, and Roy Thomas, um, which I think is a crucial one. It's a pretty early one in the uh, in the run, but you can really I think that that's one of the places where you really see. Barry Windsor Smith turning into Barry Windsor Smith, you know, at least in my opinion, where you can really see what, like the more mature artists starting to come in there. Um, oh, awesome. Where, like, if you're a fan of, like, if you know Barry Smith's, like when he was just Barry Smith, if you know his like old, his old work, it was a you know, very, very Jack Kirby like, and it's kind of hard to imagine that if you, you know, if you were, if you were to pick up like that issue of X Men he did, and then you pick up like Monster from last year, whatever that was. Uh, yeah. How do you get from there to there? And it's like, well, <laughs> a key piece of that is is Devil Wings over Shadazar. Nice. Uh, and and I love Barry Windsor Smith, but you said you're a Gil Kane fan, so I got to know, like, w what's your essential Gil Kane comics? If if someone's like, I've heard of Gil Kane, or like I've I've known from the covers, but like maybe hasn't dived in, like what era? What what um what Gil Kane you you like? That's interesting. So. Over the last couple of years, I was really digging into, uh, like, his name is Savage, and, um, uh, um, oh, God, what's the other graphic novel thing that he did, the the uh, the Sword and Sorcery one? Oh, um, I, I know what you're talking about. But oh, my I, gosh. Uh, I think I've got it behind me. So, Oh, wait, no, I do have it. Uh, Blackmark. Blackmark, sorry. Yes. Oh, thank um, God. Yeah, I was not going to remember it. <laughs> Because behind the porg on the shelf behind me. Um, uh, so I hadn't read that stuff before, uh, but I'd always heard about it. So I, I, I'm fascinated by that stuff. Um, I have also, you know, I've, I've been kind of getting into some of his like random one-off specials that he was doing in maybe the late seventies, early eighties, where he'd do like a Superman annual, like I think yes. every year for a little while. Um, you know, like, there are a couple Conan annuals that he did that I, that I picked up pretty, pretty recently that I've really liked. Um, so it, it's interesting. I've been really thinking about like a lot of that Gil Kane stuff recently. I mean, I think probably prior to that, like uh, the Spider-Man stuff, I mean, the, 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 you know, the Gwen Stacy stuff, I would, you know, I would have, I would have said something like that. Sure. Um, uh, yeah, I have a weird soft spot for, uh, uh, the ring, uh, the ring book that he did, the uh, ring of the Niblong. Uh, sorry, I don't know how to pronounce that. Um, which is such a weird book uh, to mm -hmm. exist. Um, but uh, yeah, I don't know. I like that. Awesome. I'm, 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 yeah, now I'm, I'm just I'm sort of fascinated by the way he would ink stuff with this weird deadline that nobody else would ink him with. You know, 
Uh, oh yeah, no, and I love seeing the. You read like a Green Lantern, and then you go mm -hmm. like almost thirty years later to what he's doing on like Superman and on in Action yeah. Comics, and it's like I, again, it's very. Yeah. It's not exactly like, you know, Barry Windsor Smith's transformation. It's a different kind, but it is still very like this is the same guy. Like it's Yeah, it's I can't believe I didn't say Green Lantern. But yeah. It probably that was probably the probably the first thing I ever saw by him was when he was doing yeah. Action Comics Weekly. Like yeah. do you remember like he you came back on a Green Lantern and was doing uh, doing that. And I I remember at the time being like, Well, this is pretty neat. What is what is this all about? Uh, yeah. but uh yeah, I was super yeah. little then. <laughs> it's, I mean, it sounds like an incredible project, and I mean, we, we're explaining kind of the artist edition somewhat casually. So, for those of you who aren't familiar with those, and you should be, it's um, it's oversized eleven by seventeen. It's a big book, mm. and you see this stuff just it's it's kind of gloriously presented and how it how it is put across. And with this talent on it, you're getting a pretty amazing collection of creators in one spot. With Conan, which is an awesome character always, and and what people could do, and you got two covers. You got one by Jim Lee, one by John Buscema. Yeah, um, you've got a forward by Roy Thomas. Yep. What what don't you have in the book? Ooh. <laughs> you don't have you don't have Jim Zub's current Conan. No, we don't. We don't. Uh, and, uh, and there's yeah, no yeah. afterward by Arnold Schwarzenegger. So. Oh yeah. yeah. You're you're really pointing out the deficiencies we have here. Uh, no, actually, when it comes to the the current stuff, it was a deliberate choice that, like, yeah. I mean, makes sense. I would not rule out the possibility that we you know we would love to go back in and do sort of the dark horse era with like I mean, Carrie Nord stuff was incredible. Oh, and man, then yes. I, 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 uh, Jim Zub is one of my oldest friends in comics, but uh, that aside, uh, that new run of Conan is terrific. I really it am is. enjoying that comic. We're going to talk to him uh, here in the next week. So this will be a nice collection of interviews. All it'll be Conan time on uh, on the channel here for a little bit. But uh, oh, that's cool. But outside of outside of this, so when's the project going live officially? Uh, it it should be uh, it should be this week as we're as we're talking about this. I believe. Um, Perfect. Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Barring uh, barring incident. <laughs> All right. So hopefully we'll have a link. Uh, well, basically, by the time you're listening to this, if it came out in advance, maybe there's not a link. But very soon, if you're listening to this day or two later, the link will be there. Take a look at that. And tell us where this is going. So this new publishing outlet. Tell, tell me about this that you're you're doing. Uh, the Pug? Yeah. Just okay, yes, I wasn't sure if that was a Zoop or Pug. <laughs> yeah. So, and, but, no, but you're, you're Pug. But you have the you have some partners in in this this thing. Tell me about who you're working with. Yeah. 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 So Pug was a. Uh, it, it's got its genesis in I think uh, late 2021. Uh, John Nee, who is a, a former publisher at Wildstorm, was that his job at Wildstorm? That was what I was. Yeah. At Marvel, right? right? He was. He well, he's was publisher at Marvel later on. He, he yeah. worked at DC. He worked at Marvel. He's a uh, industry veteran. Yes. Uh, he's an what, veteran. what you could say. Yes. Um, but no, he's, he's been around, uh, you know, all over the place. Um, he was, uh, he was sort of starting to assemble a, a group of, of um, like a small group, but a, you know, a bunch of people who uh, had worked in comics with maybe different areas of expertise, working in comics, games, uh, the sort of pop culture stuff. He's also one of the founders of Cryptozoic, the, the games mm -hmm. company. Um, so we, uh, we wound up, what eventually became Pug W is, uh, uh, I, I came on last summer, uh, Nate Murray, who used to be at IDW as well, uh, he mm -hmm. was um, uh, he came on as publisher. I, I came on as editor in chief. Uh, we've got a, a, a handful of other people. Um, really, not not very many. It's kind of small and scrappy, which is fun and 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 nice. Uh, it's to kind smart of when you're starting out. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. 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 <laughs> There's definitely like a. Um, this isn't the sort of publishing outfit that gets a lot of venture capital, burns through it, and tries to get bought by somebody real quick. Like that's not what we're doing. Good. I was uh, going to yeah. ask you, what's your uh, Manhattan office address? Do you have that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. I'm sure I just offended somebody directly with that statement, but that's a lot of companies. No problem, always approach. I mean, a lot yeah. of I've, I've seen so many companies uh, come out. They're trying to do something new, and it's it's they they manage to get a decent war chest, and then they seem determined to. It's like Brewster's Millions, blow it in three months. Yeah. Yeah, no, no, no. I, 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 uh, I've definitely had that thought over the uh, over my time in comics. I've seen that. I've seen a lot of places come and go, and a few of them kind of stick around for a while. And it's it's it tends to be kind of that slow and steady 
you know, might, might win the race. Um, uh, I feel like the flash in the pan stuff definitely doesn't, you know, like, like that can really blow out real, real, real fast. Uh, none of that's directed at anybody in particular right now. I'm, I'm thinking more of older companies, uh, like honestly, when, when, when I say that, but uh, yeah, no, 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 hit, no hit piece I mean, tweets, please. It's just yeah, talking yeah. generally um, for God's sake. But while, while we're on that, and, and again, not talking about, this is a target at anybody or anything, but you know, because uh, like you, you mentioned, like there have been a, a number of, smaller publishers that have popped up over the years and you know so and because some of them have you know come and gone uh pretty quickly which is common in a lot of businesses you know that they last two years and they're gone but either way it's like you might get people who are a little like ah, i don't know maybe maybe i'll hold off and, and wait until i know it's successful which can be a self-fulfilling prophecy mm -hmm. so so maybe you could go into a little more of like what makes this different? What makes this special? Why yeah. should people be getting in on the ground floor rather than waiting to see where things go and, and that sort of stuff? Yeah, so, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, no, no. So what I mean, what what, what John says, uh, I'm looking over to make sure I get I get this right. Is uh, he says uh, we make the coolest stuff in the universe for the greatest fans anywhere. But the the real key to it, I think, is is trying to get. I mean, is trying to get the stuff to where the fans are. Um, and not try to limit it to one outlet, if that makes sense, which is why like something like Zoop for this makes sense, that w um, maybe the people that are going to be into a giant Conan book aren't necessarily the people that go into the comic book store every Wednesday. And a book of this type, while we're, we are you know, very excited to have this in stores and can't wait mm -hmm. to have it in stores like that, and those stores that support us are, are wonderful and we can't wait for all that, it is like we're not we're not unaware that it's difficult for a, a, a store to heavily stock a book that's uh, this size, and it's not like it's super expensive for what it is, but it's not it's not three ninety nine. You know, like it's it, it, it's right. a yeah. It's, a, it's a, not a, an impulse you know, buy. Price tag. Yeah, exactly. But it's also one that can if that's sitting on your shelf, you, you don't you probably as a store owner don't want two of them sitting on your shelf for very long. You know, like that's that's just yeah. kind of. Depending mm -hmm. on what size store you are, I mean, you know, uh, so you know, it's one of those things where where um, comics have, have sort of the 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 audience has diffused so much over the past few years, and I think it, in a overall pretty cool way, in the sense that like I think there's more people today that would read comics and not think anything weird about it than there have been in a very long time. You know, like maybe maybe since the well, no, probably forever. There, there isn't the sort of stigma uh, or anything like that about about comics that maybe was in the 1940s or something. Yeah. Um, but there's fewer people that are like um, they're doing like what I used to do, which was I would go in and buy all the good comics, and that meant I'd be buying Optic Nerve and Young Blood and uh, <laughs> you know, you know, what I mean, like like just like like, like some some crazy mix of of of, right. of, of, of comics where um, you know this is. If you're a fan of comic book art, this is a great book. If you're a fan of Conan, this is a great book. Uh, and trying to get that to those people, like this, yeah. As an example, this is you know one of the things we're going to try to do. Not everything is going to be necessarily crowdfunded. Not everything is going to necessarily be crowdfunded via uh, Zoop. If we do crowdfund it, I mean, our Zoop's fantastic. We love working with them. Uh, they had a track record of doing that Winterman Artist Edition a couple oh, yeah. years ago. Uh, so we, you know, like that made a lot of sense. And like I said, we all knew the, we knew the right printers. I mean, this is something we could have worked around no matter what, but like the fact that like their standard printer is ours and is also the one that knows how to make artist editions better than or artist edition type books better than any other printer on the planet. I mean, I think a lot of people that maybe collect these books have maybe gotten burned on some books in the yep. past where the quality wasn't yeah. there. So we wanted to make sure the quality was going to be there on this one. Um, but yeah, no, you know, we're doing like right now at, at, uh, uh, Pug W we're doing, uh, we're doing some motion comics. We're doing some stuff sort of behind the scenes with some people, um, you know, helping facilitate some comics, uh, uh, elsewhere. Uh, we've got a comic that I'm working on called Cigna, uh, coming out. We've got uh, a line of 3d comics that are going to represent or represent that are going to, uh, <laughs> uh, reprint, uh, uh, some classic uh, comics from a variety of sources. Uh, 
in in like 3D, you know, like put on your glasses 3D. Yeah. Not, awesome. not like uh, render it all in 3D animation or something. Uh, you know, regular glasses stuff. Um, and we've got some, some uh, in addition to Conan, some other licenses that are going to come up uh, that are pretty cool for art books, uh, prose. That's nice. uh, oh, actually, that's a great example. One of our first books that's going to come out is going to be uh, a book by um, uh, John Nee and uh, 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 S.J. Roseanne called uh, The Murder of Mr. Ma that's coming out in April from Soho Press, but it was packaged by us and... Uh, like I don't know if this is meaningful to any of the any of your your viewers, but uh, uh, kind of like what Byron Price used to do, you know, where like he would he would put stuff together, and sometimes they would go out to a publisher because that was the best way to get it out to somebody. Sometimes he'd maybe publish it himself, or, or yeah, um, yeah, th that kind of stuff. So that that's really what we're trying to do is trying to reach out to the different fragments of the audience of comics. It, um, it, to, to kind of read back to you, um, if I was to kind of pitch this, I'd say this is a group that's starting relatively small mm -hmm. and they're really focusing on high quality products that they're putting out, these artist editions and some books that you're really confident on to put a good step forward. And you're going to have a variety of different ways to go to market. You're going right. to go to Zoop. You're going to do some crowdfunding. You're gonna probably, I'm assuming, through Diamond or whatever, you're into the mm -hmm. shops. There's going to be a, a bunch of different approaches. And really, you're trying to tailor the distribution method with the project you got on hands and you're being very selective about the projects and nothing of what you said was, and we're really hoping that, uh, you know, we'll get a couple things out there that Netflix will make into a series. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, we, uh, yeah, no, that's right. Yeah. I mean, Hey, it, it, uh, we're not, yeah, I wouldn't rule that stuff out, I guess. Who would, who would like want I, that paycheck? Right. But yeah, I, 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 built on it. I don't know if uh, in uh, November sixth of twenty twenty three, if if that uh, if that paycheck from a streaming service is what it was uh, 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 some time ago. <laughs> <laughs> Probably not. That said, I mean, if Netflix would just come up with some level of screensaver uh, app like they do for you know the holidays with just Barry Windsor Smith art, I'd watch that all day long. But but anyway, that's great. <laughs> um, well, that sounds good. I mean, and and it kind of it explains a little bit the question other people might be having in their head, which is why in the world would at its current state, would somebody be making a new publisher at this point with where things are at? <laughs> but um, I'm saying a little tongue in cheek, but there, there's, yeah. is it fair to say, I mean, cause there's a, there's a lot of hot takes in, in comics and where the comic business is at um, kind of all over the place, but there's still money that could be made in comics. We do see people making money in a kind of a variety of different ways. There still can be, it still could be healthy for sure. It's just, um, it's how you approach the market. Is that kind of how you're looking at it? Yeah, I think so. I mean, it's a, it's a weird time for comics, but it always has been, you know, like, like, like it, different types of weird times. Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, like comics have been dying since the end of world war two, you know, and, 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 and they, and things keep sprouting back up and, a lot of times the, the landscape will, will change. I mean, the direct market changed the landscape a lot. Yeah. Um, and I think the sort of rise of graphic novels aimed at kids and younger readers really dramatically changes things as well. Not always, you know, super positively, sometimes super positively. Um, but I think the, I mean, to me, the coolest thing that comes out of the last few years is that like kids, my, I've got a daughter who's 12 and a son who's four. And kids their age, like, really do not see a difference between reading a graphic novel and reading a prose novel in a qualitative sense. And I think that's really terrific. Like, that was, like, my, that was the dream I had when I was in the, the, the 90s trying to tell people, no, 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 look, look at Sandman, look at, look at, you know, whatever, uh, you know, uh, comics can be really good. So um, that's a very good point. And that's a major change that has happened. I mean, I have two daughters, uh, 13 and 10, and to them... It's like we talk about digital natives. So kids who are, have grown up, they've always had a phone or they've always had uh, technology. They don't know what a rotary phone is or a fax <laughs> is in some cases. But with comics, we have a similar thing that's happened. I mean, obviously much smaller scale. But kids today have now grown up for a, more than a decade where the graphic novel and a prose novel, it's analogous. Yeah. They just don't yeah. see any difference. Yeah. Yeah. And I... I uh, you know, I think that's great. You know, like, I, I, I think that's yeah. a lot of fun. Um, and, and I think like when you look at, 
we, I don't know, something like Dog Man or something. I think I think is wonderful. Like, I mean, man, I wish I had that when I was a kid. Uh, mm -hmm. it, it's it's uh, just so, so much fun, and it also has that quality that I think a lot of um, a lot of times comics blew up really big within my lifetime, which I would say would be like the nineties, um, uh, like the the birth of like Image Comics, like that sort of thing. You know, like the pre Image Comics, like those guys. Uh, when manga blew up in the early 2000s, like the initial manga boom and, and, and bubble, uh, one of the things that I think was really key to that was that sense that like you could do this. You know, if, if you were a, if you were a kid reading that stuff, here's a, a, a thing you can do. Yeah, um, I think that that's one of the keys with like why something like Dogman is so popular is that it's it's very approachable. Like I mean, the yeah. whole. The whole gimmick with something like Dogman, this is way off topic on these beautiful uh, Barry Windsor Smith art, but the whole gimmick with Dogman, <laughs> the whole setup with Dogman is that these two kids made these Dogman comics. So it's all drawn as if these kids had done it. Yeah. And, and it, you know, I think that that's something that's really, you know, really, really encouraging and really taps into the th one of the things that makes comics really unique. Once you've sort of stripped away that, that thing of like, well, if you want to go see superheroes, comics are the only place you can do that. Right. Well, that is no longer the case, right? Like, like there's more more hours of superhero TV than than I could ever watch, um, uh, <laughs> or in some cases want to. I mean, I'm, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm <laughs> kidding, Kevin Feige. Please <laughs> stay a check. Um, yeah. <laughs> what you're saying basically, though, is that uh, Barry Windsor Smith has similar art style as Deb Pilkey. Yeah, pretty much, pretty very, very almost the same thing. Well, no, like, uh, the, I mean, it, it's almost like the dead opposite of like you can't draw as well as Barry Windsor Smith, you know, whoever you are, yeah. uh, like, like, whatever I said is right for, for everybody, except maybe six people out there that, you know, like, like, like there, there's a, a, mm -hmm. a, 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 which is why this is like a cool book to come and look at. Cause it's not like you shouldn't look at the stuff that is like by the people who are just geniuses and, 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 super skilled and have put in a lot of work and, and everything. Not that Dave Filthy hasn't put in a lot of work. I don't mean that, but like, of course, uh, uh, you, you can't be Barry Windsor Smith. Anyone can be Dap Pilkey. I mean, come on. I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Is this like a Batman or Superman, right? Yes. Yeah. If I but, say uh, but it, way, it definitely cannot be misconstrued by someone else. That's no. <laughs> but, you know, talking about uh, superheroes, uh, you, you've worked with some superheroes over at uh, Marvel. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's let's. So you you did um, you worked on this um, but the rather pathetic line of comics that nobody remembers in two thousand four, the Ultimate line. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. How? So that was really when it was at its peak. Yeah, I. It, it was interesting. Um, there was a time I think before I was at Marvel where the Ultimate line was unequivocally the peak of Marvel. And that was the stuff where they were all the resources were going into that and all the, uh, all, all the eyes were on that. Uh, when I came in, it was, uh, like sort of at the very end of the Jemis era. Like I interviewed with, with Bill Jemis, but he was effectively gone from the company. It was, um, uh, uh, Joe Casada and, uh, uh, Dan Buckley was, was, uh, uh, was was coming in around that like right around then or he, he was there but he was kind of assuming the role of publisher um and they they very much were like kind of focusing on you know sort of title by title uh which is where you got like new avengers and you got the the uh uh yeah uh, you know like, i i came in I, 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 I came in between the last grant morrison issue of x-men and the first joss whedon issue of x-men oh wow so, like, okay. you know, when i when, it, when i started i bought the last grant morrison one as a fan i got a comp of the first uh joss whedon one yeah because you're not paying uh, for that no 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 yeah. uh, <laughs> <laughs> have you heard about him uh yeah. no um, <laughs> Oh right, yeah, you're right. That's that, that joke <laughs> funnier than I thought. <laughs> but uh, um, so, so the, really, like, kind of the idea. I, th I think it, it, to a certain degree, was to kind of raise everything. It, like, I don't mean necessarily raise the quality in the sense that, like, people that were doing the other books weren't doing high quality stuff, but to to sort of uh, uh, put the resources behind each each title the way the way it had been with ultimates so in a sense it was the peak of it in a sense it was also the part where where everything else was 
sort of catching up with it. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, um, I, yeah, I definitely got to work. I mean, there's some stuff that's like almost, I don't even know if it's like forgotten is the right word, but like the Brian Vaughn run on Ultimate X-Men, I thought was terrific. Like that was yeah. one of you know, like Brian yeah. Vaughn and Stuart Eminem for most of it. Um, some other great artists on there for other parts of it though, too. But uh, um, like that, the, that was then competing with a a fully functioning Avengers lineup, and and you know all, all these other things where they were really, really, really pushing things out. So uh, I don't know. It was, it was a super fun time to be at Marvel. Like I, none of that is meant as a complaint. It was, uh, oh no, no. It's, it's, well, I mean, there were a lot of artists, yeah. and, and sorry, Joe, but but yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, you had you had Vaughn there. You had uh, Kirkman doing a run on X Men, as I recall, as well. Yeah. It was under you. Uh, mm -hmm. I think Mark Millar was it was that still partly under you? Yeah, Mark was doing um uh Ultimate Fantastic Four. All right. Um he was uh, the ex like I I kind of worked on the last of the Brian Bendis uh David Finch Ultimate X Men's. Uh right. Mark and Brian Hitch were still doing Ultimate or they were doing Ultimates too. Uh Bagley and, and um uh, Bendis were on uh were on Ultimate Spider Man. Um pretty crazy and, great time, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. And then he left, and then Stuart Eminem came on. Yeah. Um, so I was, I was there through through all of that. Yeah, then, uh, yeah, Kirkman had a, a, a run on X-Men. Um, probably more successfully had a run on Marvel Zombies. Uh, right. That yeah. the, 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 the spun off of uh, Ultimate of Fantastic Four, but that was uh, that was one of the ones I worked on. And we haven't been able to get rid of that since. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, uh, it's, it's interesting, too. You got to work with, uh, you know, Kirkman and uh, you probably wouldn't have guessed all these years later that you both would get a chance to kind of oversee Transformers. <laughs> yeah, no, that's funny because I. <laughs> yeah. Uh, oh, well done, Joe. No, I, I mean I've known that Robert was a big Transformers fan for a long time, and he and I would like sometimes text about that. You know, while I was working on Transformers, and and. Uh, yeah. Um, you know, kind of, kind of make, make jokes about things. Um, but, uh, yeah, no, I mean, his, his love of that stuff is, is, is genuine and, uh, um, and, 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 and pure. So, uh, uh, I, I, I was, I was, it, it, uh, it was odd to no longer be involved in that, but it was cool to see it be somewhere where I know that that stuff's, uh, you know, well, well loved. Yeah. Uh, and very successful. <laughs> For oh, sure. for sure. And and so other stuff you did at Marvel just because there's some other projects, two other projects that are pretty noteworthy in there. One, um, and uh hopefully, I mean, he continues to try and fight through care, but you're working with Peter David on the Dark Tower series, is that right? Yeah, yeah. And I was actually was just, uh it, it was funny. I was actually just telling the story uh, uh on a on I, I do I do a podcast with David Hedgecock, uh, and I, I just was telling yes. him that story of the Dark Tower stuff. Uh, and that stuff wound up, um, it was kind of a misnomer. I, I remember in some of the comic shops, people were saying, oh, this thing isn't selling really well. Um, but it, it sold quite well, and it sold really well in trade. I mean, it was one of those things that I think logically, um, it was one of, one of the things Marvel did where the floppies weren't necessarily the lead product, the collections were the lead product. And that one, that one did a lot better than people thought. Um, oh, yeah. And it no, was just a beautiful book, too. I think Jay Lee in there as well, and yeah. Yeah. No, the, I mean, the, um, yeah, I mean, the individual issues did really, did really well oh, yeah. at least, uh, for, for, for Marvel, uh, uh, on, on that side. But, uh, yeah, yeah nobody's think, complained uh, by the way. It's weird because there's these, these stories that go on. I remember there, there's, there's a narrative of like, this hasn't been a hit, but as I recall, the individual floppies were selling in many cases, well over 75,000. Oh, sure. Yeah. No, I, I know we went to multiple printings on, on, yeah on a lot of them early on i was yeah i worked on the first the first run of it um but uh yeah no i mean that was one of the uh great series yeah that was one it had like probably two of the coolest moments i've ever experienced in in comics was involving that that series uh one was uh uh, uh the, 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 the this is uh I, I, like I probably should be directing people to a podcast that's going to come out in two months, but you'll have forgotten by then. Check it out again. Yes. Uh, we we had a meeting. No deal was signed with with Stephen King yet, right? We had this idea that Joe Joe Casada really wanted to do this series. He was a big Stephen King fan. We, I mean, so was I, but you know, he's a big Stephen King fan. Um, he was trying to impress. He wanted to like impress 
him with the the art that we were going to do. So he had this. It, Joe wrote a. Uh, uh, I think it started off as three. I think it turned into four page sequence. Uh, it was based on the beginning of the first Dark Tower book, and it was like you know Roland runs through the desert uh, and, the, uh, uh, and the, following the Man in Black. That is not the line. Mm -hmm. I forgot the iconic first line of the Dark Tower, but put that in yourselves, readers, uh, yes. uh, dear reader. <laughs> Do some work. You know, you're you're sitting here listening to this. Yeah. Do something yeah. yourself. Come on, go. Google, Google something. All right. Uh, no, but uh, uh, so the idea was to have Jay uh, draw the four pages out, then have, give it to Richard Izanov, who was Joe's main colorist, and Richard was going to paint it. At the same time, Jay was going to go back and ink it, and then uh, uh, June Chung was going to, uh, his, his, his wife and colorist, was going to come in and, and color it. And we'd have two sets of pages to show to Stephen King when he and his his, uh, uh, his people, you know, come, come to the... Uh, uh, come to the Marvel offices. So Richard painted like the first page, and we were all like, "Oh, never mind. That's it. Like that's the way it looks. Like okay, no, no need for the rest of the stuff." Funny aside, just jumping back to what we were just talking about, that meant that June Chung uh, wasn't going to be coloring Jay for a while, and that meant that she was like kind of down on a job. So uh, we just had uh, uh, Mark Mark Miller and um, uh, Greg Land had just introduced the Marvel Zombies and Ultimate Fantastic Four. We knew we were going to do a spinoff series. So we're like, you know who would draw, who would be a great colorist to be really sort of dark and murky would be June Chung. So she was actually the first person involved in the Marvel Zombies series. The rest of the creative team was actually built up around her, which I don't think she ever knew because I was telling, I was talking, I didn't, she wasn't there, but I was talking to Jay at the at Comic-Con, uh, telling him that story. And he was like, I, we, I didn't know that. I'm like, oh, okay, I guess we, I guess I forgot to tell June that. Uh, <laughs> That's such an awesome story. I'm sorry. So I, I mean, you, so that you don't get enough of that in comics. So you have somebody who's going to be on a project. It turned out wasn't needed, and you hustled and found her other work. Right, and, yeah, sure. And well, color. Really so you, you did a project around the color. I, I love that story. <laughs> you don't have enough. Yeah. So you said there are two things. What's the second cool thing? Oh no, yeah, well, sorry, I'm still on zero. I'm sorry. So Stephen King comes in, right? He comes into the office. Uh, he has his people with him, and the thing with Stephen King and the people around him, at least in my experience, where they were as cool as you wanted them to be. Like they were s super awesome, you know, very, you know, he like surrounded himself with good people that were fun to work with. I think probably less fun if you were maybe signing a contract with them because they probably did a good job on that. But <laughs> for, from our point of view, it was all, it was all great. So uh, we go in and, and Joe's like, okay, here's these pages. We printed them out in 11 by 17, full color, you know, mounted them on board. And he's like, okay, here's the, here, Here's some pages we did. Now, th these aren't the actual pages, Joe says. Uh, these are just to show you what we want to do. Stephen King takes them and he goes, no, these are the first four pages. Now, remember, there's no contract here at all. This is to try to get a contract. He goes, no, these are the first four pages. Then you turn the page, and this is the spread that happens next. And then he just outlines 30 issues of what the series should be. Uh, and uh, uh, Robin Firth, who wrote the Dark Tower Companion, and she was uh, uh, plotting the, the the Dark Tower book. She's uh, uh, one of the one of the people who was uh, working on it. She was uh, she's American, but she was living in England, so she was on the phone. And she would interject every once in a while when Stephen King got something wrong. You know, like no, Roland didn't have his guns yet. And he's like, oh right, right, okay, okay. So this happens then. And uh, 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 so she was like, you know, writing all that down. So that was that was super awesome. Yeah. Uh, the other piece was we knew this was going to be somebody, a lot of people's first comic or their first comic in a very long time. We knew we didn't want to make it look like a regular comic because we didn't have to, you know, like that wasn't, yeah. if you're coming in and this is your first comic, you're not going to have the preconceptions that you have if you've been reading comics for, for 30 years or whatever. Uh, so you're having Jay do it and having him some idiosyncratic storytelling and all that. That was all part of the game plan. That was all stuff we wanted to do. But Joe was still like, you know, wanted to make sure the storytelling was good. Everybody, everybody was very invested in this. So we had uh, John Romita Jr. came in and sat down next to Jay Lee and went through page by page all of the layouts. While like me and I think Nicole Boos were sitting across from him just kind of, you know, mouths open, like, whoa. I mean, these are two great storytellers, two of my favorite artists, just being, you know, oh, Jay, I couldn't do a page like that, but I really like that storytelling. You know, <laughs> that's, my, that's my John Romita Jr. impression. Okay, uh, checks out, yeah. Yeah. Did you think he was here? Sorry. Yes, definitely. So we can, yeah, <laughs> I'll, I'll promote him on the, uh, I'll promote him for the stream, get more viewers. Yeah. No, that's, that's beautiful. 
Um, how, so first of all, that was one last comic we talked about, and I promise we're not spending all the time on Marvel, but you also uh, did, you, you worked with this, this Rick Remender guy for X-Force. Is that correct? Or that was a different launch? No, I, uh, I worked on the, um, well, I've got it uh, wrong. The, the Craig Kyle, uh, Chris Yost. Uh, yes, Chris yeah. Brain, yeah, uh, that launch. Yeah. I've got the years all incorrect. There you go. Yeah. Okay. Well, I don't have to talk about how Remender's a jerk. That's good. <laughs> I'm just kidding. He's not a guy. We love, we love Rick Remender. I do like Rick Remender actually. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. No, I, do, I had a great time on that. Book. All right, so I had that that incorrect. But uh, you also did Old Man Logan. Yeah, that that one. Yeah. I, okay, got was, that one right. Yeah, mostly my idea. No, I'm just kidding. Yeah, uh, okay. that was totally, totally a joke. <laughs> if anybody's uh, uh, listening, to that. Yeah. was that. But that one. So, so what's funny is is now Marvel has gone to that well quite a lot. Uh, yeah. with, you know, future stories and multiversal stories and all the rest. It's hard to, to remember that when Old Man Logan came out, there really wasn't a lot of that. No. I mean, you had some time trouble, but that was relatively a new concept. Was it, yeah. was it, I mean, how, how did that come about? Was there a tough sell? Did, did, how, how would the company perceive that? You know, what was the tough sell? Well, I mean, first of all, it was, it was Mark Miller and Steve McNiven coming yeah. off of Civil War. So, no, it wasn't a tough sell. You know, do whatever they want. <laughs> yeah. yeah what's, what's the next thing they want to do? And, and, um, yeah, and it was a great idea. Uh, the tough sell, actually, and this is kind of hard to wrap your head around in 2023 as well, is uh, the, the tough sell was calling it Old Man Logan uh, because they wanted to call it Old Man Wolverine because they didn't think people would know who Logan was. Uh-huh. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, like, it's, it's funny in a world where there was a movie called Logan, you know, or where there's yeah. you know, been multiple Batman movies that don't have the word Batman in the title. Uh, yeah. But that was the world, you know, that was the world back then. That, that was the toughest part. Um, but it was, uh, you know, I think, you know, Mark, Mark had the idea for the story. Um, he had a, like, he had a specific um, look in there. I think if you, I was uh, uh, actually, bizarrely, I have the hardcover right next to me, mm-hmm. and I was happened to be looking through it. And if you look through that, it's got some of the, like, Steve McNiven did, I think, two pages initially that were more, uh, more American Western style, and and Mark was like, kind of, you know, no, it needs to have a little more 2000 AD sort of feel to it. Um, so that was really the only, uh, I don't know, I think the only like real real hiccup, other than just the, sorry, uh, other than the quality of 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 how it worked, kind of working like that, and then also, I mean, it was it was a, uh, uh, well, I don't know the right way to transition to this part weirdly brutal time to be doing it all in the sense that um, Michael Turner died during that and right. um, one of the I, I don't want to get into anybody's personal life but one of the people involved got divorced one of the people's wife died it was like you know it was kind of a rough um, you know like a, a, a rough run like Michael Turner was supposed to do covers for the whole series um, oh, and wow, I didn't he, know that. he only did one it was one of the uh, one, of, one of the last ones he did. Uh, uh, I didn't know that. Um, yeah, yeah. That's a, it, it's it's um, it, it's a fun. Well, now it's uh, now I feel like a jerk with where I was going to go. <laughs> I was going to ask you about the controversy of having Bruce Banner knock up his cousin, but uh, that seems <laughs> really, really yeah. bad taste. Um, no, the uh, the only we 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 ran into a thing where we ran into a slight problem with having one of the Hulk's breastfeeding on a cover. That was the, that was the thing we had to, I think we had to walk back a little bit on that. Uh, uh, but, uh, as you do. Yeah. Yeah. No, other than that, uh, uh, yeah, I don't know. I remember the controversy of, uh, I believe me putting Los Angeles in the wrong place on a map, uh, which is hilarious because I live in Southern California and I grew up here. I know where Los Angeles is. Uh, somehow I, I uh, uh, tagged it to the wrong piece in a map, I think. But Oh, yeah. comic nerds. <laughs> <laughs> they always put their map lore. Um, you know, you, you mentioned something, though, and I don't know if I'll, I'll make this point well, but you talked about the kind of the, the tough part of the pitch was calling it Old Man Logan because mm-hmm. people were afraid that people, you know, wouldn't know who that was. But at that time period, the direct market's in full swing. We're not in the mm-hmm. newsstand. People yeah. are getting this comic from a local comic shop. The local yeah. comic shop, despite popular opinion, does not have kind of random people from the street wandering into it. It is, it is, it has a curated audience. I mean, it'd be great if more new people are going to the comic shop. That's not really happening. Yeah. Um, so it's, I find it kind of fascinating that the, you know, inside the publisher, people are thinking, 
well, we got to make sure people know it's Wolverine. Everyone going into the comic shop on a weekly basis knows who Logan is. You've got a couple of the guy with the claws out. Like, I find that just kind of fascinating that that debate's being had given the market. You know what? I might have actually, now that you say that, uh, so if I recall correctly, I actually think part of the problem might have been that um, there was a cool series. I can't remember who drew it, but I think Brian Vaughn wrote it that was called Logan or had the word Logan in the title. And I don't think, if I remember right, I don't think that sold as well as like it should have, or as well as people wanted it to. Mm -hmm. And I think there might've been the perception that people would have thought that this was a tie into that or a sequel to that or something like that. It was all like, I don't mean to overstate this. This is Mark Miller and Steve McNiven coming off of civil war, doing a Wolverine future story. Uh, yeah. It was not a tough sell. If the hardest part of the sell was getting you know, old man Logan in there, I believe that was two emails that solved that problem. Like it wasn't like a uh, knockdown yeah. drag out fight. It was yeah. just like, Mark's like, nah, I want to call it Logan. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I, I don't think it was a, yeah. Uh, it was a it's just, I mean, it, it, the reason kind of that caught me is I've heard stories like that before where you think, you know, the toughest part of the book is going to be something. Yeah. And it just winds up being this very strange idea that people had about comics that, you know, really doesn't apply at all. But I'm, I'm you had a good time working at Marvel. And, and then you I said you went to you worked for IDW. You've worked for a bunch of different places. Any I mean, how, what keeps you doing it? Is it is it the love of comics? Is it what, why do you keep? Why do you keep putting yourself through this? Yeah, no, you know, I ask myself that every morning. No, um, <laughs> uh, I, you know, I've always, I always really loved comics. When I was a kid, the thing that really attracted me to comics was that you could go into comics and tell your own stories in it in a way that you couldn't with very many other mediums. I mean, you probably could with like novels or something, but it wasn't like, like TV shows weren't what they became later, you know, where, where you know, there wasn't a, um, there wasn't a TV show like Atlanta or something, you know, like uh, when I, when I, when I was a kid, you couldn't be also, you didn't have a camera. You, you didn't have an HD camera and editing suite in your pocket. At, at right. those days. Um, but uh, um, th that always attracted me to it. Uh, the, the, the medium itself, I, I, the potential for the medium when I was a kid, which I think a lot of it had been has has been fulfilled in a lot of ways. Like we were talking about, you know, kids kind of growing up with with graphic novels. Uh, that was a big thing. But just the, the the formal qualities of the medium, the way you tell stories in comics, yeah. um, and the the individuality that could still come through on something that it it's tough to express to somebody that isn't like super invested in comics, like why a Barry Windsor Smith Conan page is some sort of like actual piece of actual art in an like capital a sense, you know, yeah. that, that it's like, well, it's, it's, you know, it's just, it's, it's, you know, it's a product that somebody was selling that had a barbarian with the sword, but n no, there's something more to it. Like there, you didn't, no, nobody had to make those pages look like that. Yeah. Um, and the, the, the individuality of, of Roy Thomas and Barry Windsor Smith comes through in those pages and the anchors and, and, you know, uh, uh, all, all that as well. But like, um, I don't know. I just, I, I, I love that weird, um, that weird mix of how that can happen even on these sort of big, you know, corporate icons. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, that I, I remember kind of thinking even a, a, you know, a few years ago during, um, uh, it, it, this isn't to disparage anything since then, but like, I remember thinking like during Marvel now, like during that era when you had a lot of, you had like a young Avengers with Kieran and, and uh, uh, Jamie doing it. And uh, mm -hmm. uh, 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 Kelly Sudaconic was on, was doing Captain Marvel, like all those sort of things. The main Avengers book was super weird. It was, you know, there was a the Hickman stuff. It was like, it, yeah. it was all, it was, it was, you know, Dune with Avengers with these, you know, people explaining very complicated concepts to each other. And you tend not to get that in, the other stuff that comes out of comics, you know, the, the stuff that gets, sure. you know, even when you're working on the, on the, on the superhero stuff, it, it, um, I don't know. I don't know. Does that answer the question? I think, no, I, just, I think I've rambled for like an hour here. So I, think, <laughs> no, that's good. And I think it, it ties back nicely to the project. I think, you know, the, the insanity of a passion, mm -hmm. um, to be able to, to have these stories, 
this project that you've got, uh, Conan the Barbarian, awesome character. But in addition to that awesome character, you've got John Buscema, you have Gil Kane, Barry Windsor Smith, Neil Adams, Jim Lee, Arthur Adams. I mean, that is a, I don't like the expression murderer's row because everyone now uses it for everything, including when there are no murderers in that row at all. Um, <laughs> yeah, not to disparage any project, but this this is clearly a who's who of talent. Yeah, I've got uh, Howard Howard Chaikin's on here. We're pretty sure he's killed somebody. Okay, good. Yes, yes yeah, go. he got an actual <laughs> murder there. Oh, Howard. Um, Do we know how Will Eisner died exactly? Are we sure? <laughs> Hang on. <laughs> it's going to be a bleeding cool article if you don't. <laughs> right now. Um, I don't know. It looks like a cool project. It sounds like a cool company. I mean, just, just the way you're approaching the market and kind of obviously, I think I was on with um, a different creator talking about how, uh, you know, more people should not keep doing this. But uh, but this, is, this <laughs> seems good. This seems like a good plan that you, with what you've done. Yeah, no, a big part of it is, is sort of you know, keeping the passion of the stuff that we like and, and hopefully that comes through, you know, and, and keeping ourselves excited about it. Um, That's and, awesome. Yeah. Well, um, I, I listen, I don't want to take you for too long, but I'd love to talk to you again at some point. Would you Would you willing to come back on later? And Yeah, absolutely. If I didn't uh, wear everybody down with my yammering, yeah, absolutely. Oh, no, no. <laughs> We'd love to talk more about kind of the business and some of these aspects with you. But for now, I hope everybody goes and checks out the book. Conan the Barbarian, yeah. colossal, colossal edition. That's right. Lem by 17, right. big, doesn't get bigger than that. So, uh, what, what is the page count about? Yeah, uh, how, big, how big is this thing? Oh. Yeah, uh, it is. Uh, sorry, I'm uh, scrolling down, making sure I get this right. It is uh, 192 pages. Jesus Christ. Right. It's pretty big. Yeah. <laughs> 192 uh, pages, 11 by 17, hardcover. Yeah, there's, a, a, I think, a little over, if I'm not mistaken, a little over 160 different images there's a couple of them where it's actually like we have the original and then we've got the stats where they mocked it up into a cover yeah um so you know there's a couple things get repeated there's a, a beautiful neil adams painting in there in full color that uh uh were just super cool to see um so yeah yeah yeah, yeah. a lot of pages a lot of pages you with uh, also there's uh, historical information by uh, chris ryle uh who's writing intro to each of the sections um yeah, he's, he's very familiar with the era of, of, of Marvel. Uh, and I should mention Ian Chalgren, our designer, who is uh, uh, just kicking ass on this, doing an incredible job and, and really just letting no detail get left uh, un, un, untended. Um, this is really going to be a, a thing of beauty. Yeah, no, it sounds like it. And, and you mentioned it at the very beginning. I mean, a lot of people don't realize there was a point where Star Wars and Conan were the tent poles for Marvel. Yeah. By my yeah. and you're seeing a lot of that work by the masters here. Um, well, incredible. So, John, hey, thank you very much for talking with us uh, tonight, and I hope people go and check out the book. And yeah, let's talk to you again real soon. Cool. Thanks a lot. All right. Thank you.